Welcome back to the Clinical Athlete Podcast. If you're not familiar with Clinical Athlete, we're a network of healthcare providers who specialize in the management of athletes. You can find your nearest Clinical Athlete provider at clinicalathlete.com. We also have a Clinical Athlete Forum where clinicians, students, and coaches network, discuss, and share ideas and resources related to sports med rehab and performance. To join the forum or for a possible listing on the Clinical Athlete Directory and for all upcoming Clinical Athlete seminars and events, details can be found on the website. This podcast can also be found on clinicalathlete.com YouTube and iTunes, and hopefully soon to be Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, all the fancy ones that I don't know anything about. My name is Quinn Hennick. I'm a doctor of physical therapy in Orange County, California. My clinic is called Clinical Athlete Newport, and I'm joined by Michael Ray, a doctor of chiropractic and owner of Shenandoah Valley Performance Clinic in Harrisonburg, Virginia. What's up, Mike? Hey, Quinn. How's it going? Good. That it just rolled off my tongue that, that time. Was, Did you hear it? That was perfect. <laughs> Pretty, that was the best one. Uh, and of course, also joining us is Derek Miles, who's a doctor of physical therapy at Stanford Children's Health. What's up, Derek? Good morning, Quinn. Good morning. And we'd like to welcome a very special guest. Meryl Alapatu is a doctor of physical therapy, a PhD in rehab science, and currently a research assistant professor at the University of Florida, whose current research is focused on the mechanisms underpinning female chronic pelvic pain and the development of sound and effective treatments for that condition. Dr. Alapatu, thanks so much for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, we wanted to have Meryl on to discuss a very important topic in the realm of women's health, which is urinary incontinence in athletes. But before we dive into that topic, Meryl, can you give a little background in regards to what led you kind of through this path in, in your career? Sure, absolutely. So I got interested in pelvic health as a specialty practice area of PT, and Derek, you probably remember this lecture because we went to school together. Um, it was one of my current mentors, Vicki Lukert, was giving a talk on uh, manual therapy delivered by physical therapists for infertility. And so this was a topic that I was just, I, you know, as a green-eyed PT student, I said, wow, how does that actually work? And so I went ahead and did an internship with um, with Vicki when she moved over to UF Health, and she wasn't doing any of the fertility stuff, infertility stuff anymore, but she was really focused on developing their pelvic health program, and the majority of patients she saw were people that had issues with urinary and fecal incontinence or pelvic pain. And at that time, it was primarily women that she was seeing. When I graduated from school and we started working together in the clinic, we actually helped build the uh, male pelvic health program at UF as well. So started to see, I, I would say the majority of my practice actually was male patients post prostatectomy. And so worked in a tertiary care clinic for people that were undergoing um, different types of cancer treatment. And, you know, for me, it was just the difference that you see in the quality of lives of these people um, that have this incredibly personal and to them embarrassing taboo issue that they don't want to talk about and for them to be able to talk openly with you about it and to see the difference that you can make in them in their lives was really powerful for me. I think that's a great segue into talking about urinary incontinence in general. Can you mm -hmm. define the term and the different subsets and then kind of go into the history and prevalence of the condition and then probably mm -hmm. more importantly, the stigmas associated with it? Sure. So urinary incontinence um, by definition is any involuntary leakage of urine. And so there are a few different subsets. The most common ones that we deal with um, are stress urinary incontinence, which is any involuntary leakage of urine associated with an increase in intra-abdominal pressure. So this might be incontinence with coughing, sneezing, jumping, heavy lifting. Um, urge urinary incontinence is incontinence associated with a sensation of urgency. So the three, four of us are sitting here. We have that urge to urinate, that feeling, okay, I've got to, got, got to get to the restroom. We can probably hold off 30, 60, 90 minutes before we even have to think about, hey, again, I've got to get to the restroom. Someone that is, has issues with urgency, they get that sensation to, to urinate, and you're talking five minutes or less, they are rushing to get to the bathroom and oftentimes leak on the way to the restroom as well. So that leakage associated 
with that feeling of urgency is called urge urinary incontinence. And then a combination of these is called um, mixed urinary incontinence. It's a combination of both uh, stress and uh, urge incontinence. And so prevalence-wise, um, incontinence is a pretty prevalent issue. Um, so it's it, it's it's thought to affect, depending on what study, what prevalence study you read, over 50% of women and um, nearly 14% of men. I think men, male incontinence, the focus really has been in the literature related to um, surgical complications or uh, incontinence related to surgery, so post prostatectomy incontinence, for example, has been studied pretty heavily. In women, it's associated with um, older age, obesity, uh, childbirth, um, and being Caucasian as well are thought to be the risk factors for incontinence in women. And I think from a practice perspective, women are probably managed for their incontinence um, probably more than men, I think we're starting to see that shift a little bit. You have more, um, at least in rehab, physical therapists that are uh, treating men for their incontinence as well. Well, I think part of the reason we wanted to have you on the podcast is because occasionally we see these instances of a story being reported with a female having incontinence while performing some type of athletic event. And then mm -hmm. You and I have discussed this in the past. When we start talking about how common this is, it, it really comes down to a, why are we not talking about this? What do I need to know? And who should I be sending this to? Or what can I do about it? And mm -hmm. I, I think for our listeners, all six of them, um, having this discussion and being able to facilitate mm -hmm. some type of guideline or even some heuristic that they could follow in order to know how to comfortably talk about this with their athletes and mm -hmm. then what they may want to look for and when they may need to refer out. You know, at Florida, I was very spoiled because I could just call it, hey, go see Merrill. But now mm -hmm. that I'm on an island, I actually discussed with some of my fellow clinicians that we're trying to find someone with whom to send these patients to. And, you know, if you could even give our listeners some <clears throat> things we might want to look for to identify a more efficacious practitioner. Mm hmm. So, you know, number one, why isn't this problem being talked about? It's still, it's, it's still an extremely taboo topic, and um, you guys are all clinicians, and so you probably do a systems review when you get your patient or your client in front of you. And so what does your systems review for the genitourinary system consist of? Probably consists of something like, are you having any urinary or bowel issues, Right. So if you get, let's just throw this out here, middle age or older, white female, um, three vaginal deliveries, let's say she's you know, 65, 70 years old, maybe this isn't an issue for her because she views it as normal or a normal part of, of aging. And so asking if she has any bowel or bladder issues, you're screening that system, but you're not really getting, you're not asking her specifically if if she's having an issue with incontinence. And so asking a specific question, um, there's a very, there's a great uh, single simple screening question that you can put on your intake form or ask patients directly, have you leaked any urine, even a small amount in the last three months? And that right away will tell you, okay, this is something that I need to explore a little bit further. Was this a one-off, or is this something that's happening consistently over time, um, or uh, over time and in response to specific activities or specific movements? Um, I think the other thing that's important to ask your patient or client is, okay, you've identified that you have an issue with incontinence. Is this something that you think is affecting your performance? And so one of those articles that I sent you guys, I think it was up to 40% of those athletes felt as though their incontinence was infecting, as it was affecting their performance, but the majority of them hadn't sought any help for it. And the article didn't go into why that was, but um, some people, again, may think it's normal, may be fine with it, may be fine with wearing pads um, and don't really want to address the issue any further. And uh, so I think it's important to ask, do you want help dealing with this issue? I can refer you to uh, a physical therapist that specializes in uh, urinary incontinence management or pelvic floor dysfunction that can help you with this issue. And so 
I think that's a big uh, that's 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 a that's a key part of it because even if you get someone that you refer to a physical therapist for their incontinence, that patient going and seeing that therapist, you know, once a week or whatever it is, because those patients typically aren't seen extremely frequently, if they're not on top, they're not compliant with their home exercise program, so their pelvic floor muscle uh, strengthening program, you're probably not going to see much of a change. And so, uh, the, you know, that from that compliance perspective, I think that education is is important to let patients know about as well. You know, this is as important as you coming to see me for rehab or coming to see me for in the gym for training, whatever it might be. So could you walk us through what some of these treatments might look like? Because I think part of the concern and I think most therapists and rehab specialists across all titles would concede this there's often a lack of comfort in a blind referral because sure. there's a lot of BS going around in all professions. And you and I have certainly discussed some of the, those dogmas in pelvic health in the past. Mm -hmm. um, what should the clinician be looking for in what the provider they're going to refer to is going to do? Um, so, you know, I, I would recommend that the person who you're seeking this care from, there are a couple of different um, uh, websites that have information about therapists that specialize in pelvic floor dysfunction. So one is the section on women's health, um, the, Amer the APTA section on women's health, PT locator, which lists physical therapists by their specialty practice area, whether it's incontinence, pelvic pain, if they treat men, if they treat women, if they treat transgender individuals, if they treat children, um, and then obviously where they're located as well. Um, there's another organization, Herman and Wallace, that also has a pelvic health provider directory. I mean, I would say that the majority of people that are working in this area aren't just your standard physical therapist said, oh, I'm, I'm going to start treating pelvic health. The vast majority have undergone advanced training in this area. And I think that's a fair question. You know, if you're going to refer, if you go to the, and one of these websites and find a physical therapist and you're going to refer a patient to that therapist, I think it's totally fair for you as a referring provider to give that person a call and say, hey, this is a patient I have. I'm thinking about you know, referring them to you? Do you mind kind of going over the training that you have or what expertise that you have to manage this condition? And so I think that's that's totally fair. Um, there's a few different credentials uh, that are out there. So the section on women's health has a, um, it's called a CAP credential, which is basically a certificate of achievement in um, pelvic health. Um, there's also the women's clinical specialization, which is the board certification offered by um, ABPTS, the American Board of Physical Therapy Specialties. And so you don't, and I, and I don't, I wanna make this very clear, you do not have to have a certificate. You don't have to have your board certification to be an effective pelvic health provider. I don't have any of those cert certifications. I don't know if I call myself effective, but um, you know, it's not. It's definitely not something that's um, required. But if that's something that's important to you or to your patient for people to have those credentials, those are ways to identify. But I think just having an open conversation with a therapist that you're referring to is a good first step. Um, the other thing as a referring provider that you want to be able to do is to make sure that you can talk semi-intelligently um, about what that patient should expect from this first visit. And so you know, what the physical therapist is going to do at that first visit. They're going to, you know, take your history. They're going to get an idea of the type of incontinence that you have, what exactly is happening when you leak. Um, they may or may not do a pelvic floor muscle exam, which is the internal pelvic exam at that visit. It's certainly not something that's required, um, but they may do it at that first visit depending on time and obviously rapport uh, with the patient and the patient's consent to do so. But that internal exam will give an idea of a rough idea of how strong those muscles are and how much um, how much the patient is able to contract the pelvic floor muscles. You can also view that visually, but again, the palpation, I think, gives you a better idea, at least at that um, 
at that initial visit or early on of what to expect um, or for the for the examination. Um, they're also going to do just a general screening of your lower extremities, um, your you know, range of motion, strength. Um, they're going to assess if you have pain, a, the pelvic area, so the external pelvic area, the internal pelvic area as well. They'll probably ask you questions about leakage during um, intercourse, leakage during ejaculation or with erection, um, other leakage-related activities. So the questions do get you know pretty personal in nature, but there's a reason for that. And we're trying to identify what is causing you to leak or what types of activities are causing you to leak. And so it's not because we want to be personal just for the sake of being personal, but it's really trying to get at you know, the issue. Um, and I think most physical therapists do a really nice job of either having a pelvic model or the anatomy right there um, to kind of explain why they're asking the questions that they're asking and how it's going to help them uh, develop a treatment plan. So depending on what that patient presents with, um, the treatments can, you know, can vary anywhere from, um, you may patient you may may have therapists that do electrical stimulation for patients that have very weak pelvic floors or are unable to elicit any contraction or a strong contraction on their own. You may have patient you may have therapists that do EMG biofeedback as a way to kind of visually um, demonstrate to patients how their pelvic floor muscles are working. You may have patients that do or you may have therapists that do um, functional pelvic floor muscle exercises. You know, your very basic Kegel is your pelvic floor contraction, also called a Kegel, is you lying on your back, supine, and you imagine the, you, there's several different cues that you could use. The cue that I like to use for patients is imagine that you are about to meet the queen and you feel that gas is about to escape and you want to try to stop that gas from escaping. And so that's, I mean, everyone's tried to hold back a fart before, right? I mean, maybe. And so that's kind of something that people know. Quinn, Quinn, <laughs> Quinn doesn't care. But that's something that people can relate to. And, you know, for me, visually able to see them do a contraction um, and to make sure that they're not doing a uh, glute squeeze, they're not holding their breath, they're not squeezing their, um, their adductors. And so just being able to see that I think is important. And I think it's for patients, they're kind of surprised that the pelvic floor muscle contraction is that small of a movement. You know, I can't tell you how many patients I've had come into clinic and they say, you know, I'm doing a hundred kegels a day and I'm not getting any better. I don't know what you're going to do for me. So, you know, they're sitting right across from me and I say, okay, well, show me, show me how you do your kegel. And so this is what I see. Meryl's bobbing up and down for our audience who's not <laughs> so, watching the video. So that's not a kegel, right? That's you're you're doing you're doing a glute squeeze, you're doing a butt squeeze. And so having having someone that can actually demonstrate or tell the patient, instruct the patient on how to do a pelvic floor muscle contraction is important. And that's why, you know, I'm a big proponent of if you have if you have a client or patient with incontinence, I'm a big proponent of sending them to a physical therapist that's trained in um, the management of incontinence, even if it's for a short period of time, for them to make sure that the patient knows how to correctly perform a pelvic floor muscle contraction and put them on a treatment plan and, and you know, go from there. Um, other types of exercises, you know, if we take that very simplistic Lying on your back, Kegel, there may be, you might, if you're leaking when you cough or when you sneeze, teaching you or part of your program is to squeeze your pelvic floor muscles or do a Kegel before you cough, before you sneeze. If you, if you leak when you come from sitting to standing, teaching you to squeeze before you come from sitting to standing and maintaining that. And so there are different strategies that people take. There are also, you know, kind of for our more advanced patients um, that have issues with stress incontinence, some therapists will use vaginal weights. And so there are these surgical steel, medical grade surgical steel weights, I think they're about a pound or two, that are inserted vaginally and patients will do pelvic floor muscle contractions, you know, with, um, excuse me, in standing with those. And so there's a variety of different 
types of interventions, um, but I would say they're pretty individualized um, based on the patient. Um, and that's kind of for stress incontinence. Urinary or urge incontinence, um, you may have some of the same, same strategies. There are also some behavioral strategies that we utilize with these patients as well. Uh, so if you've got a patient that every time, I, I had this uh, male professor once that came to see me, and he said, you know, I go on my smoking break every hour, and every time I go to have my cigarette, I've got to, I've got to go to the bathroom. And I said, and so we, you know, it took some time to kind of get to what the trigger was, but he walked past his bathroom every single time he went to go have a cigarette. And so he felt the urge to urinate. It was probably something that just kind of started innocuously. He said, oh, I might as well just go to the bathroom. And then it turned into this habit. And then it got to the point where he was having to urinate every single hour. And so teaching him to recognize that, hey, this is a trigger for you. Here is a strategy to suppress that sense of urgency so that you can go take your cigarette break without this feeling of urgency to rush to the restroom. There's also some dietary modifications that um, people can make in terms of the amount of um, caffeine they're drinking, the amount of total fluid that they're drinking, timing their fluid intake based on when they're going to be doing these activities, and then also taking a look at their medications. Is there are the medications that they're taking, could they be contributing to um, this patient's urgency or frequency of urination as well? So what I'm gathering out of this is we can't just squat and deadlift this one away. You can't squat and deadlift it away. I think it's, and that's, that, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I, I think it's important when you're trying to identify a therapist to send these patients to, I think there's somewhat of a stigma. I don't know if it's a generational thing or not, but that, uh, you know, if you're leaking, you shouldn't be lifting heavy weights. Or if you're leaking, you should just avoid this X, Y, Z activities altogether. And so I think you have to be, you have to find a physical therapist that's kind of willing to work within this patient's life and what this patient wants to be doing um, physically, recreationally, and kind of work together on that. Um, but I think with that, you know, is this a matter of when is the patient leaking during their squat? When is the patient leaking during their deadlift? So being able to identify that and give them some strategies to help control that during that movement, I think is important as well. It could also be like a load management issue as well, Meryl, for those athletes. Mm -hmm. Like at a absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so maybe it, it may be a matter of decreasing that load and incorporating this pelvic floor muscle contraction or this um, Kegel Kegel contraction at that point, and then gradually increasing it as well. It's not that you have to stop everything completely, but being able to kind of scale what you're doing to include pelvic floor muscle training as part of that. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting because one of the papers you sent us, and we can talk about it a little bit because I think it definitely bears some discussion, the um, paper by Carvel House that mm -hmm. said that uh, athletes are three times more likely to have incontinence than non-athletes, and right. this is at an elite level. And it, it's crazy the dogma that's built into a lot of our training because there was a high prevalence of this in trampoline athletes. And mm -hmm. no matter how much I wanted to resist it, my initial response is, why are you doing trampoline sports when you're having incontinence? And in the back of my head, I'm sitting there going, because you fucking want to. And right. that's why, so we need to figure out how to get you to where you can do that. Mm -hmm. And it's just crazy that mental dogma that we're still fighting against. And no matter how obvious it is, it still is ultimately about what the patient wants to do and what can we do to help them get there. Absolutely. Meryl, I've got a couple questions, just kind of a checklist coming down. Yeah. I think you've touched on a lot of them. My first question to you was, what can we do to get more women to seek care? But I'm going to change that to what what can we do to get more people to seek care? Mm -hmm. And then I, I think you touched on it with that question in the screen, which I'm now going to add to my intake. Uh, immediately, mm -hmm. do you is that just just having that you know simple screening questions to get people to talk about it? Is mm -hmm. would you say that that is the most the easiest most reasonable way to get people to seek care? Are there any other strategies to to get them to speak up about these issues? 
I'm a pretty firm believer that unless with topics like um, incontinence and, you know, the other things that I work in, you know, sexual pain, pelvic pain, unless you ask your clients or patients directly about those problems, they're probably not going to offer them up as, unless it's it's gotten to the point where it's so bad that they're actually seeking care for that specific problem. Um, and so I think starting that conversation as their healthcare provider is a great way to, to get that started. Um, based on that their response to that questionnaire, that, that single question, you, there are other questionnaires that you can give them to identify, is this actually having an impact on their quality of life and how severe is that impact? And so that's kind of the next step forward, you know, with that. But I think it's, it's really asking them, letting them know, hey, there is treatment that can help you with this problem if, if you're interested. Let's take... A clinician in my demographic, for example, a mm-hmm. male, young male, no young. women's health, pelvic floor, yep. youngish, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> no, no other prior training or experience. Beyond adding those screening questions, mm-hmm. asking if it's something that's affecting your performance, is this something that you want to seek care for? Is that the end of the road for a clinician like me? What business do I have going any further than that? And I'll just kind of tell you in my experience, what I've done previously is, is simply what Mike alluded to, which is load management. I, I, I work with a lot of barbell sport athletes and I ask mm-hmm. them, where's the intensity threshold at which you start to have your problems? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's get most of our work there. Y- you can throw on a uh, voluntary Kegel, if you if you can at those loads, sometimes it's like 300 plus pounds mm-hmm. on the deadlift, you know, and so I'm, I'm much more of a load management thing, and that's pretty much as far as I take it. Is that – this is a stay-in-your-lane conversation, mm-hmm. essentially, I'm asking you. Is that where I should just continue and then refer, or can a clinician with my demographic teach more of a home exercise program with a little bit of, of reading and, and training, or do you recommend I, that I just save that for the professional? No, I mean, I think it's – I think – I'm also a big proponent of clinicians that are maybe not, you don't need to be a, pel- you don't need to identify as a pelvic floor physical therapist to provide conservative treatment for incontinence. And so I think, you know, one way to assess, you know, how, you, one way to assess is this, is what you're doing effective is, you know, to ask uh, your patient, are you having any difference in your symptoms? Are you leaking less at this load? And if they are, great definitely keep, you know, continue doing what you're doing. I mean, anyone can teach a patient with, you know, verbal cueing how to perform a pelvic floor contraction. You know, you don't have to have the patient derobed in front of you and you assessing the area outside their anal sphincter to do that. And, and, you know, um, I teach courses on this both to DPT students and also to clinicians that, hey, there are conservative ways for you to, um, manage incontinence without having to do an internal exam or anything like that that you would do with with specialized training but if you were to apply those 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 that that home exercise program and your your young male athlete was not having any change in his symptoms and this still was an issue for him and it and he felt like it was you know affecting his performance and he wanted to do something to improve it, then that's the point where I'd, you know, I'd say, hey, I'm going to refer you to a physical therapist that specializes in incontinence management. And I, and it's not like you're sending them off onto this, you know, black hole and you never see them again. Um, I think it's important for you to, as kind of their primary physical therapist, the referring provider that they're going to continue to work with, uh, for you to work closely with that PT so that both of you guys have an idea of what the other's doing as part of their um, training or treatment sessions. What were those um, surveys? Any objective outcome measures? Yep. So there is the um, incontinence impact questionnaire, which I think is seven questions. Um, and then there is the um, ICIQ UI short form um, that 
So the incontinence impact is impact of incontinence on quality of life. ICIQ, UI short form, is um, measures impact um, of symptoms on quality of life as well. And so there, you can probably pick one or the other just to keep it just to keep it brief. Um, the ICIQ I think is used a bit more commonly in the literature than the incontinence impact questionnaire. Any special considerations for barbell sport athletes? And I guess maybe I'll backtrack. Is there any literature whatsoever in regards to that specialized subgroup of, of barbell sport athletes and any special considerations other than what you've talked about thereof? I, one specific example I can think of is, is a, a female lifter who's at the world-class level in the sport of weightlifting, mm -hmm. and it's pretty much just pretty much a guarantee that they're going to have to clean the platform after a heavy clean and jerk. Mm -hmm. um, and she just steps forward after the clean and, and <laughs> so she doesn't slip and during the jerk. But is there, is there any special considerations in regards to that when they're lifting a relatively high percentage of their one rep max loads are so high, mm -hmm. you know, internally, or is it a similar process recommendation wise? I mean, I would say this, the process is similar in terms of the recommendation and you know, like you said, when you're lifting loads that high to even to be able to know that you're contracting your pelvic floor muscles because, you know, you're bracing. And it, so I think I think working with the physical therapist that specializes in barbell athletes um, and incontinence in these in these individuals is probably a good start. There isn't a lot of literature there uh, out there, though, related to um, heavy weight lifters and incontinence. I just reviewed a paper um, a few months ago. I think it was for PMNR. I don't know if ever if it made it to publication yet or not. Um, that was related to incontinence with um, I think it was a, Olympic lifters. And but there's you know even the paper that I sent you guys, the Carvalis paper, kind of grouped. Uh, weightlifters, and there weren't where well, there weren't that many in that in that weightlifting group, um, but there's really not a lot out there regarding weightlifting and incontinence. Well, one thing we talk about a lot, even with our elite athletes, no matter the sport, is nobody's ever been too good with the basics. So I think having some discussions regarding this and just figuring mm -hmm. out what the basics are mm -hmm. can be informative. Because if you're doing nothing, starting somewhere is a step in the right direction. Oh, absolutely. And, you, you know, do you even know how to do a pelvic floor contraction? I mean, that's the most basic I think you can get at. Meryl, I have a question, and I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I know some of our listeners that are clinicians will probably have this question. Do you have a mm -hmm. recommendation for dosage for, um, for like, Kegel exercises? The what, there's no um, – there's no – specialized protocol or one that works better than other. Um, but you would, because pelvic floor muscles are skeletal muscles, I think it was in that bow article recommends that you would train these muscles just like you would any other skeletal muscles in the body. And so, you know, recommend eight to 12 repetitions of, um, slow velocity, close to maximum contractions, uh, anywhere from, uh, I think it was three to four, three to four days a week. And so I think this is kind of where we get into a bit of an issue because when these patients come to see us in the clinic, they're not coming three to four times a week to have me sit there and watch them do their pelvic floor contractions, right? And so a lot of what they do and their outcomes, I strongly believe, are related to their compliance with the program. And I think that's, that's an important thing to share with patients, you know like the patient that came in that's doing 100 kegels a day, you wouldn't walk around and do 200 bicep curls all day long, right? So why would you do the same with your pelvic floor contractions? And so kind of giving them that, that framing, framing it that way for them so that they understand um, this is not that different than training principles for, for any other muscle. Um, for the people, and this is just anecdotally, I can't tell you that there's any any studies to back this up, for, but for the people that do have issues with jumping or running and that's, you know, when they're leaking, that weighted, um, that weighted, the, the medical grade vaginal steel device, the, the vaginal weight um, does seem to help those people a bit better than just the uh, pelvic floor exercises against gravity. Okay. Well, and that kind of 
in my mind, you can add the, the Kegel with the movement of choices, like let's mm-hmm. say a squat or a deadlift. It, it's probably hard to control or to create like a conscious pelvic floor contraction when you're at a certain percentage of your of your one rep max. You just right. You can't focus on specific areas like that. Your body just kind of works automatically, and then maybe you have problems. But perhaps at like sub maximal loads, 30, 40, 50 percent of your one rep max in a deadlift or a squat, and you're doing like tempo, super slow movement, and then layering on a pretty intense conscious Kegel contraction within the movement, is that potentially a beneficial way to incorporate it into the training? Absolutely, because you're still doing that contraction against some level of load, right? So I think that's that's a, totally a fair way to incorporate that into their training program. And it wouldn't be a clinical athlete podcast without actually, Derek, you got some. I'm gonna I'm gonna go into myth busting. Do it out here, okay? It wouldn't be a clinical athlete podcast without some myth busting. So, Meryl, can you think about? Oh, I don't know. The last week of what you've seen on the internet, I'm sure that you see things all the time. What are the most common, most common things or recommendations on the internet that you f- see that are probably off base, and uh, what what is more of the you know correct information? Just what the myths that you see. Well, so I, the one that I sent you guys yesterday was the one from the um, NHS website from the UK, and it was um, ten ways to stop leaks, and so. You know, I think one myth is that people think that, okay, if I just do kegels, my incontinence is going to get better or I'm going to be cured of my incontinence. And it's really, kegels may be a component of that, but if you're constantly contracting and you don't know how to relax those muscles, that's a problem. So it's not just a matter of, you know, doing kegels all the time. The other myth I think that's out there is that people just need to stop doing what they're doing um, be, when they leak. So if you're, you know, and maybe this is, maybe this is my feminist side coming out, but I think you know women are often told after childbirth, if if don't do sit-ups because if, you know if that causes you to leak, it'll worsen your diastasis recti. Um, don't run after childbirth because you're leaking a lot. You know, so and you know it's not just women, but telling people to stop doing things that they love doing simply because it causes their leakage rather than trying to identify what about that movement is causing their leakage and working within that framework to help improve that. Um, another one is, well, if leaking causes, if, if heavy lifting causes you to leak, well, just don't lift heavy things anymore. See if you can have someone help you with that. And so, you know, if you, I think you guys would, you know, appreciate how bad that advice is, you know, uh, what is it? Adam Eakins can't go wrong getting strong. I mean, so that's kind of the mentality that I take, you know, with, with patients is if, if there are ways to improve your strength, not just, you know, from a, from a looks perspective, but from a quality of life perspective, from a morbidity perspective, why would you want to tell people to stop doing these things because it causes their leaking rather than trying to get at the issue of why this leakage is happening? And so I think those are the, those are the ones for me that I think are pretty meaningful. I, I think, uh, once again, to kind of circle back, like a big part of the reason we wanted to have you on wasn't... Uh, I think most people that of our six listeners, maybe five by 45 minutes into it, they, you know, tune into this are very pro heavy lifting and mm-hmm. everyone's going to agree with what you just said. I, I think the bigger point for a lot of us is figuring out like, one, why is this such a stigma if it's so common and what do we need to do in order to address it? And I have a feeling we'll have at least one listener who be tuned into this and say, man, I didn't know this was this prevalent. Mm -hmm. And I think bringing that kind of awareness is a big thing. Like, you know, if if we make everyone suffer through ED commercials all the time, why aren't we talking about the prevalence of incontinence? And we can address that just as easily. We have specialists like you who have means with which to do that. Absolutely. And I think, you know, part of it is training the next generation of therapists um, or fitness professionals, healthcare providers, that um, it's okay to ask patients about these questions. You're not 
going to come off as, you know, perverted or that you're trying to get some weird information from patients. But these, these are legitimate questions that we should be asking, um, especially with we know, especially given what we know about continence impacts quality of life. If there's something that we can do to improve that, why wouldn't we as health providers want to address that, you know, with our patients? And so I think having podcasts related to this and just getting people comfortable talking about this with their patients is an important first step. I have another myth question. Yeah, go for okay. it. Can you talk about the common narrative that I hear in regards to if I if I quote unquote breathe and brace correctly, or if I learn how to brace my core correctly, that'll help with my stress incontinence. And just the whole notion of core strengthening in general on the topic. So I don't believe that there's great evidence for core strengthening alone. That'll make sense. Two for incontinence. Oh, I'm uh, smiling on the inside. And I think I, and I think I just read some a paper about this yet paired core stabilization exercises versus core stabilization and pelvic floor muscle exercises versus pelvic floor muscle alone, I think it was. And I thought that pelvic floor muscle exercises alone and in combination outperformed core stabilization alone. I can I'll double check that, but um, you know, that's, that's another one of those myths that, you know, the amount of bracing that you do, if you don't have your pelvic floor muscles that are able to withstand the pressure that that bracing brings on, well then there goes your leakage. I mean, or there goes, there goes your urine rather. And then the mechanism of the pelvic floor, you know, the, the structure is like a reflexive group. I would, you know, ideally, the thought of with with breathing drills in regards to how how taking a breath in can create a pelvic floor contraction. I'm asking this question because I know it's taught in certain systems mm -hmm. where if you breathe in, your respiratory diaphragm pushes down mm -hmm. and essentially pushes your insides against your pelvic floor, creating an eccentric pelvic floor contraction. Is that even plausible? Is that a correct explanation of biomechanics? Um, I could not tell you that one way or another, to be honest. I know that there's been some work that's come out recently. There's a lot of, there's a lot of CE courses out there on breathing, and I think it's um, hypopressive therapy. Um, that's related to breathing. And I think Kari Bo actually, they actually, she published this, I think it was just this past year, early this early earlier this year that just, you know, debunked this this whole notion of, you know, hypopressive exercises being a way to manage incontinence. And I know that that caused kind of a big stir in the pelvic health PT community because this is something that, um, Many courses are, are sold on and kind of this, a lot of the foundational training that people receive, the advanced foundational training, I think is based on some of these concepts. I just don't know that they have um, held their own against the empirical evidence. So basically exactly like orthopedic and sports physical therapy. Similar. CE, cor CE Similar. courses abound. People get advanced certifications and there's l very little evidential support I don't know that we have as many certifications in pelvic health as there are in um, orthopedic and sports. Uh, it's, <laughs> occasionally, we just put the alphabet up on a dartboard and throw three, and that's what you're going to get certified in today. But I think you know, I think that's the important thing is that you know, pelvic floor physical therapy is you know effective for a variety of conditions. Why it's effective, I still think we're trying to find that out. I don't know that we have that narrative written yet. And I think we're getting there. And I know that, you know, the work that we're doing is trying to, you know, chip away at some of that. So, you know, and that sometimes that's that's not what people want to hear. They want to be able to tell their, their patients or clients a very, you know, cohesive story or narrative that makes sense. And we don't know a lot still. I certainly don't know a lot still. So 
I think we're still learning. I think we're, we're, we're getting at it a bit more and more, but we still, we, we have a ways to go. Maybe you should go get like six or seven more certifications. That'll yeah. get you there. Yeah. <laughs> if only. Yeah. I don't have the money for that. It's, <laughs> I mean, or the time I could be reading what? actual research instead of listening to someone else. Tell me that if I push my diaphragm down, I'll eccentrically train my pelvic floor. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, if that works... I'll, I will happily take the stance that I know Quinn wanted Meryl to take there. It's bullshit. <laughs> I think well, you, but, so, Plausible, maybe. Plausible, maybe. And if, if it's, it's also it's, plausible, there's a teapot floating somewhere in space. But then, you know, the, so then the other side of that argument that you hear is, well, my patients seem to do really well with this approach or with this technique or whatever it is, then, you know, what's the cost benefit of that? Could they do equally as well with a therapist that didn't, didn't use this approach or didn't use this, this patented technique or someone that didn't have this certification and this type of training. And so I think that that's, that's a toss up. Um, and so it's, yeah. I don't know if we've okay. actually, sorry, Quinn. I don't no, know if you've actually said this thus far, but of the research articles that you sent us and I read through thus far in the research evidence, pelvic floor, muscle training through exercise is the best current evidence we have for, for yep. this issue. For incontinence, absolutely. I was going to ask about uh, palpation and some of the mm -hmm. manual techniques. Do you find that you're running into the same barriers that in traditional orthopedics with reliability of palpation and not quite understanding the mechanisms of the manual interventions? Yes, um, especially for incontinence, you mean? Yes. Yeah, so um, I don't do a lot of manual therapy. When I was treating patients, I didn't do a lot of manual therapy for incontinence. The, the manual palpation that I did was primarily to get a sense of how strong their pelvic floor contractions were. But even, you know, the grading scale that we use for grading pelvic floor muscle contractions doesn't have the best inter rate reliability. Um, so if I'm seeing the same patient over and over again, it's just me, that's one thing. But if I'm, you know, transferring this patient back and forth between me and another physical therapist, if we're going to be assessing the patient the same way, we may not be getting the same results in terms of um, how strong we think their pelvic floor muscle contraction is. So I think it's, I think palpation has its place for um, from a cueing perspective and for me to get a sense of do they have any sort of contraction at all, particularly if I can't visually see them doing a contraction, because that's where I start. I start with, okay, you're derobed in front of me and, you know, they're lying on their back and just show me how to do pelvic floor muscle contraction or show me how you do a Kegel. And then if I don't see anything with that, then I may do an internal assessment as well. But again, that's certainly not something that has to be done. And obviously you get your patient's permission, consent, you, you know, you, you get all that ahead of time. And that, that muscle um, strength testing that you're describing, it, that's not mm -hmm. any different than any other muscle strength test that we do as far as like uh, inter-rater reliability. It's all pretty weak evidence for those anyways. It is, yeah, it, yeah particular, particularly between um, between testers or between assessors. Right. So, Mara, I know you have to run here soon because you have some other obligations. Um, you want to tell our six listeners where they can find you, and I know you're affiliated with some groups that are trying to combat this on the forefront. So, I think it would be a good resource for them to be able to, you know, track all of your. Uh, advocacy for the groups. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am a member of the APTA section on women's health. And so the section on women's health has a ton of resources on its website. They also have a Twitter account, a Facebook page. Um, they also are the one of the leading um, organizations that offer training in this area. So if it's something that you are you know, even interested in dabbling in, you could go to a weekend course and the, the level one courses deal primarily with incontinence. And so you could spend a weekend learning a bit more about this, if that's an, an area you want to get into. 
Um, I also do some work with Girls Gone Strong, which is an organization um, started, I think it's geared primarily towards health and fitness professionals, but um, their goal is really to provide health and fitness professionals with um, evidence-based practice principles and care um, for women. And obviously incontinence is, is, a, is an issue that affects women throughout the lifespan, um, but you know, with their pre and postnatal certification, it's, um, it's a big component of that and also um, with their general certification programs as well. Awesome, Meryl, thanks so much for being on the show. This was really Thank great. you guys. Hope you, you guys learned something and uh, uh, got something out of this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. All right, guys, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>